Hello Tangerinis! Welcome back to our channel. If you're new here, my name is Maddie. This is Jordan. We are currently in our Tangerine Mobile, which is why we're called Tangerine Travels. We have been traveling through and living in Mexico for the past, well, over two years now. So we love this country, but there have been some struggles that we did not expect to encounter when traveling and living here. So that's what we're going to be talking about today, things that we've personally struggled with, and whether you're a traveler or you're planning to retire here, or live here, or just come on vacation, these are probably things that you are not expecting to deal with as well. Okay, I lied, it's actually not been over two years, it's almost been two years, because we started on January 31st of 2018, and for some reason January of 2020 feels so dang long. I thought it was over already. I thought it was, Feb <laughs> I thought it was February, honestly. <laughs> Before we dive in, we wanted to just give you a quick heads up that after we started making this video, we realized that we were remembering more and more unexpected struggles that we had after coming to Mexico because as you might expect going to a new country with a mm -hmm. new language and currency and culture and food and all these things a lot is a struggle at first so we ended up breaking this video up and it's probably going to be two or maybe even three parts. So if we didn't mention something in this video, it's probably going to be in one of the next ones. Mm. So you come to Mexico and you're like, I want to try all the most authentic Mexican food. I'm so excited. People rave about how good it is. But unfortunately, you open the menu you and- You go out for breakfast and you see chilaquiles and sopes and molletes and you're like, I don't know what any of this means. <laughs> You're like, okay, no problem. I'll just open up Google Translate. But unfortunately, these things don't always have a translation. So if you're still learning Spanish, of course you can ask the server and they will be delighted to tell you. I think the best solution is to look up pictures and recipes so you know the ingredients. <laughs> Something that was really a struggle for us when coming to Mexico was learning the tipping culture. I think this is something that's hard enough in your own country. There's so many times in the US where I just don't know what to tip or what's appropriate for or, a particular or if, situation. If you should or not. But here, one situation is baggers at grocery stores. Those are unpaid laborers. Their only wage is any tips they get. That's a must tip situation. Taxis in the US, it's very common to tip your taxi driver or Uber driver. And here, it, here in Mexico, it's not customary whatsoever to tip taxis. However, you of course can. We don't mean to imply like don't tip your cab driver if they're helping you with your luggage or something, but it's still to this day, two years later, we're still navigating tipping situations and what's appropriate or not and when we should and when we shouldn't. But as a general rule, we've talked about this before, after talking with many Mexicans all across the country, 10% is pretty standard across the board. At restaurants, when in doubt, are you saying? Well, well, like when in doubt, I think 10% is okay. And like at restaurants throughout Mexico, 10% is customary. There are some exceptions and one of those exceptions is tourist towns that has a lot of visitors from the U.S. because they get used to higher tips because mm -hmm. uh, people from the U.S. are used to tipping more and also at higher end restaurants because they're splitting it with a lot more people. One final note on the topic of tipping because I know we're gonna get tons of comments on this. It's a very controversial topic, but 10% is pretty standard across the board, although we are not trying to say only tip 10%. If you wanna tip more, by all means, do what you feel is appropriate. Go ahead and ask people, see what the local customs are. So another struggle is adapting to cultural changes. And for example, one that you may, might not know when you come to Mexico is that when you're at a restaurant and you want to leave, you have to ask for the check. They're not just going to bring it out to you because that's considered rude here. It's kind of like forcing you out the door. And I thought this was so weird at first, and now I prefer it. Yeah. Because you don't I feel I rushed. You feel it. like you can take as much time as you want to eat your meal, and they're not like, okay, we've got a tennis table over, let's get out. <laughs> as long as we're still eating breakfast, I'll tell you about one that we really struggled with and to this day have never solved it. Trying to order eggs over easy. <laughs> We've gotten phrases such as huevos estrellados, huevos fritos, huevos suave fritos, huevos tiernos, huevos no bien cocinados. All the phrases, and then we think we have it down, we say it to a person, and then in Spanish they respond, oh, you mean blah, blah, blah. Whatever other version of how to order eggs that they know of. So then we're like, Got it, perfect. Next time, we're gonna know. We're gonna go to breakfast and it'll be no problem. What do we do? We say that phrase that the previous person told us to say, and then that person's like, I think you mean this. Ah! Forget it! Ah! We ended up giving up because it, it just, they aren't cooked that way here. You, can, you cannot order them like that. If you, if you want to, you can be like, 
uh, cosita wealthy vuelta con la yema blanda and then they'll look at you like you have four heads. Looking back at the U.S. and how many options there are for cooking eggs, it's like it's a little bit ridiculous. Like, and, and now I'm okay with estrellados, which means sunny side, side up. up. But yeah, we just gave up. Like as soon as we finally memorized what to actually say to order them that way, it was like yeah, that's good enough. And even even sunny side up, even estrellados, it varies a lot from restaurant to restaurant. So that's just one of those things that you have to be like, okay, this is Mexico. I'm just gonna learn to love it. <laughs> So we just ate at this place called El, El Pirata, which is on the beach side of Puerto Morelos, where we're currently living. It's really good. They have breakfast combos that are super cheap, like the one that we had, which is chilaquiles, bread, fruit, coffee, fresh squeezed juice. Um, super filling. Like I can never eat it all, and yeah, it's only particularly a good price for the beach side of town here. Yeah, and it was only 95 pesos for all of that. The next struggle that we had was paying for things in Mexico because unlike the U.S., many cities and towns often places only accept cash. So if you're coming here, like, oh, I'm all prepared with my zero foreign transaction credit card. I'm gonna be good to go. I don't have to worry about pesos and U.S. dollars or whatever. Well, you come to a town like Puerto Morelos, and many places only accept cash. So then you have to figure out where to get cash out, what's the best way to do it so you don't have a bunch of ATM fees and currency exchange fees and all that. So that can be a real struggle, especially if you're used to paying with card everywhere you go and like even use your phone on the, the card reader to do it quickly or you do it with your smartwatch or whatever. We actually did a video on this, what we think is the best uh, credit card or the best card, the best bank to have for traveling. So we'll link to that right up here. Something some people struggle with when coming to Mexico is they go through immigration and then they get this little card and they don't realize that they have to keep that they toss it out or don't pay attention to where it's located and then they go to try to leave and they can't leave the country well you just have to go buy a new one they it's not like they don't let you leave but beyond that just understanding the immigration policies and going through immigration processes it has been such a struggle for us especially going through it the renewal here in Cancun it's I can't even tell you how much of a nightmare it's been but essentially when it comes to immigration if you're just coming here for a week it's really easy to overlook a small detail like holding on to that little FMM card so you don't have to pay a fee when you go back to the airport and realize that you need to get a new one so it's a little bit of a struggle to understand that and then when you go beyond that and try to get temporary residency for instance like we have it gets even more complicated and the language difference like it all being in Spanish makes it even more tricky to navigate. One thing that we've really really struggled with in Mexico especially at first was filling up at the gas pump before we <laughs> came here we heard of so many scams and stuff around that so it was kind of nerve-wracking to try to avoid that kind of thing and our, our first time you'll our, never our, forget your first time <laughs> <laughs> our, our very first time we're in Puerto Penasco in the northern part of the state of Sonora and we pull up to get gas and he said something to us in Spanish and we're... Something to the effect of cuánto quieren, like how much do you want or something. But our Spanish was, wasn't was nearly as advanced as it is now, so we're flustered Stop. and we're like, okay, do we say it in pesos and gallons and liters? Oh yeah, I just went into full-on panic mode because I'm like, I don't know how many, like in my head, I don't know how many <laughs> liters my car holds, like yeah. how much... Pay, how many pesos do we have? What do we give him? What do we ask for? And and then, just, I didn't know what unleaded was called. I didn't know what premium, like I didn't know any of that. So we're just staring at it with a blank face while our minds are racing and he goes, fill her up. <laughs> <laughs> we're like, oh, so yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> Since that time, we learned what we think is the best way to do it. And to, to avoid all these scams yeah. because we've really only been almost scammed once. There's a million and one ways to get scammed at the gas pump and we're not going to go into all of that in this video but what we are going to do is tell you the process we go through to avoid all those scams. So to start out we give them our undivided attention. We're not talking mm -hmm. in the car, we're not looking down at the phone, we're not doing anything. Yeah. We're just 
focusing on them so they know we are watching this whole thing, so don't try anything. The next thing is you want to ask for the specific amount that you want in pesos and what type. So unleaded is magna, so if we wanted 400 pesos, we'd say 400 pesos de magna, por favor. And then eyes glued on the person and glued on the pump, you want to see that it zeroes out. So they'll type in the amount and then it should go to zero <laughs> on the screen and then they'll start pumping it for you. That's another thing. They pump it for you. You can't pump it yourself. <laughs> And then when you're done, you give them, this is important, give them exact change. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, announce what you're giving to them as you're giving it to them. So if it's 500 pesos, say 500 pesos with the bill in your hand as you're handing it to them. So there is no confusion that you gave them a 50 versus a 500. They would have to point that out right at that moment. So that's another way to get around that like switcheroo that they try to do. This is what we do. We've never been scammed except for almost one, one, time, <laughs> one time we didn't have exact change. This is the only time we didn't have exact change and we're one for one with an attempted <laughs> scam on us. But we gave them 500 and I think we got 300 worth of fuel and they tried to only give us 100 back. <laughs> it's like, whoa, whoa, like, whoa, whoa. May fault the cien, cabron. <laughs> This is a struggle that's quite appropriate for today. <laughs> As we're bouncing from shade to shade so that we don't get sunburned, it's that the sun in Mexico is much stronger than I'm used to even living in the Valley of the Sun, Phoenix, Arizona. So from literally day one, it has been a struggle to stay covered up and not get burned because for me, I just even look in the direction of direct sunlight and I'm already freaking burnt like a lobster. <laughs> so see how strong this sun is? I can't even... I literally cannot have, I can't not have sunglasses on because it's so bright and I have green eyes. They shield me from nothing. <laughs> it's a huge struggle. And then especially when you go in this region, the Riviera Maya or Quintana Roo, the sun, you're even closer to the equator, which I'm pretty sure means the sun index, the strength index of the sun is stronger. You can be out for less time and get worse burned, burned worsely. <laughs> yep. Anyway, English is my first language and that's that's all we got on that one. <laughs> hey Maddie, what do you call a seagull living in the bay? Bagel! <laughs> <laughs> so a struggle for me from day one has been adapting to using a new currency and starting with like what each of the coins are and to recognize what's a 10 peso coin, five, one, two, whatever, and the bills, but then also to kind of figure out a quick way to do it in my head to know what 50 pesos is in US dollars or you know whatever whatever the price is and kind of gauging is this a good price or is it not a good price mm -hmm. and so that's yeah that's still been a struggle math is not my strong suit <laughs> yeah although i'm math isn't a problem for me it still took me about a year before i was no longer thinking in terms of dollars where mm -hmm. i could just see a price in pesos yeah. and know how much that is and, and of course it's, it's been a process over time knowing like what bread should cost or eggs or, or whatever when you go to the grocery store and clothes and different things like that even that has been an adjustment over time since this is puerto morelos i'm guessing this is morelos right here but i don't see anything that indicates that this guy has a big head <laughs> no wonder they named the town after him <laughs> Okay, another thing that's been a struggle to get used to are the sounds of Mexico, the orchestra of sounds that you'll hear throughout all the different cities. It really took me a while to, like, for instance, rockets go off all the time for holidays, just because people feel like it, maybe they want to annoy people, who knows. And we're not talking like big missiles, we're talking like, like big fireworks. Yeah. They call they call them cohetes, cohetes here. Cohetes, yeah. For a while, in my head, the, they were guns being shot off, so we were scared of everything when we first started traveling through Mexico, so we just thought like people are shooting off guns all the time, and it was like pretty scary. There was one time we were in Puebla recording a video, and all of a sudden someone shot one of those off, and it happened to go off really close to us. Like, oh, we were so loud higher up because we were at this thing but it scared me we were at this thing <laughs> to death <laughs> we we were at this park with what's that thing called where it's a, like a tram that goes in the air i don't know that's why i call it a thing <laughs> <laughs> i forget like a sky sky tram we'll call it that tram there you go <laughs> this is getting way off topic <laughs> but anyway we're like eye level with where it went where it exploded and it was so loud but oh gosh Oh my god. Okay, I'm thought, awake now. I Holy those shit. are gunshots, but they're rockets that people shoot off. Holy shit. 
<laughs> I hope medical isn't more expensive because I think I just had a heart attack. <laughs> oh gosh. Yes, the symphony of sounds in Mexico takes a little while to get used to when you're used to having more peace and quiet. Even though I lived in Phoenix, it's a big city with lots of sounds. Not quite the sounds of like roosters crowing at all hours of the night and dogs barking all the time or like yeah, different types of rockets going off, someone playing Justin Bieber in Spanish at like three in the morning for no reason. Well, I, re I remember that at four and five in the morning too. Yeah. Really loud, our neighbors. I really liked Spanish Justin Bieber. I don't know. Ah, uh, air conditioning. This place right here, our car that we're sitting in right now is one of the very few places in Puerto Morelos that has air conditioning. Mm -hmm. Fun fact. <laughs> If you're liking this video so far, please subscribe to our channel. We make videos every single week about our life in Mexico and also travels across the world, including our guilty pleasure, Las Vegas. We went to one of the other air conditioned places, one of like three in all of Puerto Morelos, and there's this really cool wine station at Shadrawi where you can like pick your glass and pick your size and get wine by the glass and just sit down and enjoy. So I'm using this little card that we got, it only has 18 pesos, I'm gonna have to put more on it <laughs> to get an actual glass of wine. Um, but like this one for instance, 60 pesos for a glass of wine, 34, 32. Okay, so you load some money on here at the register and you put it in, subtract your wine, I choose you. I didn't really know that was a thing until coming to Mexico. Maybe this is a good thing that I haven't been able to find this because I'm a bit of a sugar fiend. I love licorice of any kind. It's my favorite candy in the world. In two years, I haven't found it anywhere in Mexico at all. Not whatsoever. I've looked all over the place until... This Shidrawi in Puerto Morelos a few days I ago. I thought you were about to say this shit showed up. <laughs> this Shidrawi. <laughs> this Shidrawi, this grocery store in Puerto Morelos, just a few days ago started carrying two different options of Twizzlers. <laughs> I was in shock. <laughs> Silly things like that, but I mean. So, this is not. This is serious business. Okay, but I just mean like <laughs> this is not life or death or anything, and it's definitely something you could live without. But sometimes you just want a comfort of home. Like Twizzlers is something that you really enjoy. It's your favorite candy. And we asked you guys in our Facebook group what you thought was a struggle for you in Mexico, and someone actually shared this story: figuring out what cheese to buy. I remember one time very specifically, I was trying to find cheddar cheese, not American pre-sliced junk, and I couldn't figure out what all the other types were and I was almost in tears over this cheese until I decided to give up trying to find cheddar. This was all within the first couple months of moving to Mexico so my Spanish was basically non-existent and I was going through a little culture shock. Now that we've been here over two years I know where to get what I want and some things I've just learned to deal without. We totally 100% agree with this and it is especially at first a struggle like you just and it's so frustrating you don't know how to ask for it you don't know where to look for it sometimes you have to go to a totally different store or a market and it can be very frustrating and try your patience and get on your like remaining nerves and I I've been there too like just wanting to cry over like some silly little thing but like I just can't figure this out uh. <laughs> so we've learned there's some things that you just find but you figure out where to look for it and other things you find a substitution for and others you just have to learn to live without on the topic of comforts from home one thing that has been kind of frustrating while we're traveling and living in Mexico is that when we're browsing online often the website that we're looking for end up being in Spanish and in Mexican pesos, which while that's sometimes a good opportunity to practice our Spanish and really get pesos in our head, mm -hmm. 
like, occasionally you're just looking to do a specific thing online. You're not trying to hassle with all of that. Yeah, and we're not stupid when it comes to online stuff. We know how to ch go to the bottom of the website and click US or something instead of Mexico. But there's a lot of websites that don't have that option or make it very, very difficult. Or you have cookies that are being saved to your browser, so it like legit is like, you are in Mexico and I will not believe anything else. <laughs> For example, something I like to do pretty often is go to a news site like yahoo.com just to see the headlines in the US, what's going on there and things like that. I go there and it takes me to Yahoo Mexico and it's all in Spanish, all news of Mexico and I just want to switch over to the US. So something that allows us to do that is a VPN. And this has so many benefits, like we've talked about how we like watching US Netflix, but you can't do that in Mexico. With a VPN, you can. With a VPN, you can also place yourself in the United States, or place yourself, your browser, your... Um, yeah, the your location of your computer. Location, exactly. So that you can see these sites in English and in your currency, and like this would work all over the world. So it's a very helpful tool to have while traveling especially, and to get all these extra benefits. Mm -hmm. The one that we recommend the most is at Tangerine vpn.com this is not our vpn but that link will take you directly to the site of the vpn we recommend the most we will also put this link down below in the description and we're affiliates with this company so if you make a purchase through that link it does help us continue making videos like this one next big struggle we've dealt with since day one is driving in mexico and i think Maybe it should be expected that when you go to a new country, any new country, that the driving habits and rules and everything are gonna be different than what you're used to. But it was like, for us, it felt like total chaos at first. Is, now what? Now what? It's a green light, right? I'm so confused. Yeah, it's a green light. You have people coming to the left here. Uh, okay, go. We have a green light. There were just ambulances making everyone do some type of crazy thing. I hate this. <laughs> this is insane! And a lot of it had to do with we're trying to translate and understand the street signs, people's driving habits, navigating kilometers per hour since we were used to miles per hour, and then even random stuff that would come up like People sometimes will just stop their car in the middle of the road <laughs> on a one lane road. They'll just stop and put their blinkers on. To and get they, a lote or something. Sometimes it's understandable or they're moving, like so they're unloading a whole car full of stuff, but it could be a one lane street and they're just stopped on it for however long they need or want to stop there and that's just like the way that it is. So 45 cars start piling up behind them, but that's just something that happens. So. Different things like that are things that we've experienced or, you know, navigating cab drivers and their craziness, driving like bats out of hell no matter where they're going and making evasive maneuvers that are scary and tricky. Some of the things I thought was tough, all of the different driving customs on the road and all these unwritten rules, like if you're on a highway and the person in front of you has their left turn signal on, that's indicating that they realize you're behind them and that you're free to pass whenever it's safe. Or another one, people will use their emergency flasher lights all the time. You see this a lot. And I feel like in the US, the only time you see that is when someone's on the side of the road or something, their car's broken down. But here in Mexico, the emergency lights are to alert you that, hey, something's going on up here. The traffic might be slower, there might be something on the road, it could be a number of things, but if someone has their emergency lights on in front of you, that's just an uh, indication to pay more attention to what's going on. Another one you just mentioned was cops will drive with their lights on all the time. It doesn't actually mean they're pulling you over, they just want you to know that they're there and, you know, be doing what you're supposed to be doing kind of thing, but for a while we were like, Anytime that happened, there's a cop behind us. We're like, crap, we're getting pulled over. And But no, not really. But like I said, we can make a whole video on this, so we're not gonna go on and on about the just driving one, even though there are quite a few things we could say. Another thing that's been very difficult for us to figure out, and it's still taken some getting used to, or still navigating it, is paying bills in Mexico. So what I was used to in my adult life in the US was setting up some type of online bill pay and connecting my credit card and then having it auto pay every month. So you have to go through the trouble of setting it up at first, but then once you get that initial work out of the way, you're good to go. Yeah, here 
pretty much every time you get a bill, you have to go to a physical location to pay it. So this is our water bill, and we're here at AguaCon, and we have to go in here to pay this. The water ATM. <laughs> water ATM, yes. Okay, and it's all in Spanish, of course. Toca para enseñar. So in this case, you're putting in your number, your client number that you get on the bill that they deliver to you at your front door, by the way. It's totally not secure at all. It doesn't even come in an envelope. They just stuff it in like the side of the door. So hopefully the wind doesn't blow it away. I know. Otherwise, you you'll enough. get hit with a late fee or you'll like stop getting water depending on how they want to do it. Okay, those pesos, por favor, señorita. And after we get to zero here, it's going to spit out a receipt for us. Boom. Hey. Ha-ha. Just like that. Once you know how to do it, it's really easy. But if you were to get one of these water bills, you'd probably be like, how the heck am I supposed to pay this? <laughs> and where do I go and what do I do? But every month we have to do this. There's no like setting up auto bill pay, which I personally think is a huge pain in the ass, but that's just what you gotta do if you want water around here, so. <laughs> I, I think you can pay in advance, and I think you could just like shove a 500 peso bill in this machine and it would pay you for a few months ahead of time, but I'm not exactly sure if it works like that. Or whether they would just go, thank you for 500 pesos, and then give you your bill next month and you have to pay the whole thing. <laughs> like, you really don't know. The gold mine for paying your bills in Mexico is right behind me. Every two months we get our electric bill, and we come here. You don't have to know a word of Spanish to do this. You just hand them the bill, they scan the barcode, and then they add seven pesos to the total. That's their fee for you paying the bill there, and then you give them cash for it. But you can make bank deposits here, withdraw from your bank, I believe, pay credit cards. Uh, I think you can pay your internet bill. You can do a whole bunch of things here. We like to call it OXO's secret menu. Kind of like in and out They have like all of the secret things that you can do. Oh my gosh, it's so windy. But yeah, you'd actually be surprised all of the stuff that you can do at OXO. Um, this is also where we pay our cell phone bills every month. Uh, we have to pay cash for it, but you just pick the plan you want and it's super easy. And of course you can get all of your typical like uh, convenience store items like sodas and snacks and some alcohol, mm -hmm. cigarettes, candy, like whatever you want. But OXO is a very useful place to go and it's like when in doubt, go to OXO. You can probably figure it out there. Uh, for those of you really in the know, I would love to know what else is on this secret menu. What yeah. can you do at OXO that we didn't mention or that you might not know just walking in there? Yeah, what are their limits? Where, wh When will <laughs> they draw the line? When do they actually say no? <laughs> so please excuse our incredibly dirty car. This is so embarrassing, but we were like underneath this tree, so this even- This sappy tree, this happens in like three days. It's so bad, but every time we get our car washed, a day later it looks like this, so please don't judge us too much for this. Also, the bats don't help. They really don't. They knock them all off the tree. These bats that we have in Puerto are huge. The wingspan is like 40 feet across. <laughs> I'm just kidding, they're not that big. She's not exaggerating at all. No, never. But yeah, when we first came to Mexico, it was really a huge struggle to figure out all of these things. Like, you wouldn't think it would be a big deal to get those jugs of water and exchange them and know exactly how it works, but when you're not used to doing that, it was a huge struggle, and it still sometimes is a huge struggle to this day. Speaking of struggles, I think I'm going the wrong way on a one-way right now. Oh, but it's, it's not marked, but I see all the cars are parked the opposite way. Now there's a cab coming. Jeez. You almost hit someone in a walker. <laughs> Laska, excuse me, can you tell me about anything that's been difficult for you in Mexico? Unexpected challenges that you've had? Laska. Oh, okay. And what else? Oh, I understand completely. Is there anything else you're struggling with? You gotta know, Laska. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> good girl. <laughs> You're such a good girl following us all over Mexico. <laughs> While we're home, we decided to do this one with Laska because you guys always want to see Laska. What is the next struggle that we've dealt with? <laughs> that is mail and sending and receiving packages. Mm-hmm. 
Um, so it can be quite difficult to get things from point A to point B because the Mexican postal system isn't always reliable. And for instance, my mom sent us a postcard and we never got it. It just, I don't know, it went into the abyss of Mexico postal. I, so. And, and we don't even have mailboxes where we live, so no. it, they just, like bills and stuff, they just stick it in your door. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to be honest, when it comes to addresses and stuff too, I have no idea how to write them. And where we live actually is not even on Google Maps, so it's not like you could go, okay, here's my house, boop, and Google pops up with the address. It doesn't exist. This is the jungle. But anyway... <laughs> not to harp on this too much. Because of the postal issues here, we had this sent to Phoenix and oh. picked it up on a recent trip. It's a little bit delayed. <laughs> Yeah, but like by eight months or something. Let's open it up. <laughs> oh gosh. Let's see what we got. Oh my gosh, this is actually really cool. Oh, that's sharp. Presented to Tangerine Travels for passing 100,000 subscribers. Well, ask you to come in here. You're responsible for like 40,000 of our subscribers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is really cool. We're not in this for the subscribers, but we've worked really hard to build this super cool community, so thank you so much for being a part of it. I'm not gonna get all cheesy on you guys. Thank you for being part of our tangerinis, our tribe of tangerinis. Ugh. So we really wanted to go to this place that used to be called Chilpayas, and we put it in a video before because it's super good. And it actually closed and then reopened under a new name, but it's the same restaurant, the same recipes and everything. It's now called Escochin. But this brings us to our next point that I totally forgot about until right now. It has been a struggle since we started traveling in Mexico to figure out what the hours of places are and you cannot trust Google Maps. Like, I was kind of a religious Google Maps user. In the US, you use it to find the place's menu, their hours, their website, their Facebook, whatever, photos of the food. And here in Mexico, it's totally unreliable. Often, businesses won't have their up-to-date information. They won't have their website. Maybe they don't even have a website. They might only have Facebook or something, if they even have that. But that's been a struggle, is just adapting to kind of like you just have to ask people, you have to talk to the restaurant and find out or walk around and find the restaurant. But that was a huge shift, especially for me, being someone who's like avid Google Maps and TripAdvisor and uh, what are some other ones? Yelp, like yep. using those websites. I use Yelp all the time. Gracias. We're grabbing dinner to drink at this really great seafood place here in Puerto Morelos called El Pesquero. It's on the beach side of town and good prices and very good food as well. Bien, bien, ustedes? Bien, bien, gracias. Si gusta, pones un poco. Ah, perfecto. Gracias. Ah, también voy a querer guacamole. Se puede preparar sin cebolla? Sí. Okay, soy alérgica. Gracias. Me das filete del día a la ferro cruzana. Por favor. One thing that we struggled with at first when we first came to Mexico is trying to get over the fears that the U.S. media had pounded into our heads for the last 20 or 30 years. When we first crossed the border, everything was scary to us. Everything was new. Not only their driving maneuvers, but you would see federal police or state police or military with guns on the back, like carrying guns around and stuff. Oh, that and, was scary at first. Yeah, yeah, but now we see that just basically normal. I think it was like a combination of we are in a new culture, we're in a new country with a new langu language that we're trying to learn. So there was a lot that was actually scary and intimidating just surrounding that. But then also the fact that we are just told over and over and over like Mexico is dangerous, you're going to be kidnapped, you're going to be um, murdered, you're going to be like hurt or whatever, robbed or all these things. You're just told that over and over and over and over on the news, on Facebook. You read it in articles. Articles. And then like, after we told family that we're going to Mexico, like they just it sent was just more of that stuff. <laughs> those articles saying stuff like that every single day. <laughs> yeah, so that was a struggle to get over, but I'm glad that we pushed through that and found out how great Mexico is because if we just like listened to our 
our gut saying, this is scary and dangerous and I don't like it, and went home, we would have never found out how awesome Mexico is. What I ordered here is this amazing thing called a cazuela, which is tequila with orange, and toronja is uh, grapefruit, and chili salts. Did I say tequila? That's, that's the fun part about this drink, but here, look at this thing. It's so huge and it's got these big fresh slices of fruit on it. Oh Tell my them God. how much it costs. Was it 95? This gigantic drink. Yes, this is a drink, not a soup, but it's more like tequila soup. <laughs> <laughs> this is a place that you have to come in Puerto Morelos to get this. You cannot find this looking like this anywhere else. So although this is totally not a unique to Mexico thing, another thing we've struggled with since of course we're driving throughout the country is finding parking in certain cities like Guanajuato for instance is an old city so it was built a long time ago not meant for cars to be driving through it nor parking around it um, also Puerto Morelos there's limited parking especially in high season like we came to this restaurant and like there's three parking spaces here and also street parking but it was like cross your fingers hopefully we get a spot <laughs> this is one we've struggled with a lot Mexico is so diverse and there's so many amazing places that we want to see. We have no idea. You scoff, but I'm dead serious. We, I mean, we don't know where it's to... It's a little bit comical that you're dead serious. But we don't... Decision but, anxiety, decision fatigue, what are we going to do? No, like, it's not so much decision fatigue, but it's like there's so many places on our list of what we want to visit and go see again that we can only plan so many trips, so it's like, how long, how many years is it going to take us to see all these places? <laughs> and, it, and, and, to be fair, we didn't say anything on this list had to be negative. Struggles can, this is a good struggle to have. I'm glad we're sitting here, like, there's so many places we we want to go uh -huh. like it's gonna take a lifetime to explore this country it's a, it's a good problem to have very uh, I love this meal so much it's their uh, fish of the day so it's a really big fillet and I usually sp split this up into two meals it comes with all kinds of stuff on top of it like green olives and peppers and tomatoes and bathed in this sauce it's, it's so good uh, it is 200 pesos but for a huge fish fillet and all this other food considering it's split into two sizable meals i think that's a really good deal and seafood's expensive anyway even though we live by the ocean well i think that about wraps up part one of this video <laughs> yeah in just a moment here on the end screen we're going to have our binge watch everything playlist if you easily want to watch our whole mexico story and our story from the beginning on youtube and we would love it if you subscribe to our channel so that you can be part of our tangerines, our tribe of tangerines. Oh, one more thing. <laughs> one more thing. Gong that bell if you want to be the first to be notified when we release part two of this video. And we'll see you then.